With no further ado and much excitement, thank you, Shay, for coming and taking the time. <clears throat> uh, and we appreciate all the people that are on Skype. Some are on Skype because this is uh, a class that they need made up in the order of the things that they're, they have taken in Bible school. That would include, uh, well, I don't even know if they're on here, are they? <laughs> okay. Well, that would include at least... At least five other people on this list. So we're glad that all of you are on here, whether it's uh, required or you're just hungry for Jesus. Um, the name of this class is, actually, the, I'm naming this one <coughs> the Gospels. Uh, I've taught this class one other time. Some of you may remember, and I called it the Four Gospels, and it was a completely different sharing that I did at that time than what I'm going to do now. And I want to say that if you ever get a chance and you never heard that other class, it's really, really good. Ask Mallory, right? <clears throat> One of her favorites. It really is a good, incredible class because it divides the emphasis of the different gospel writers and shows it in the scriptures why their emphasis was that way as opposed to one another. Instead of all of them saying exactly the same thing, they were coming from four different angles, and the explanation of that is in that class. <clears throat> in this class, <clears throat> I'm calling it the Gospels, and I'm, I'll just say this from the start. I am not particularly put, I'm putting John in with this um, uh, clumping that's going to take uh, take place right here at the first, because John does have a little bit of a different angle of these things. <clears throat> but for sure, we're going to be talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And what we what I'm going to do is this class, this course is going to be <clears throat> divided into at least three different sections and maybe four. <clears throat> and those sections are, this first will be to prove what the Gospels are not teaching, what they're not teaching. And in some cases, that will refute a lot of things that you've been taught, but we'll see it clearly. I mean, it's, it's just a fact, but we'll have to take a little bit of time to go through that. So we're going to prove that because there's no need of really getting into what they really are teaching um, until we've cleared our minds of a lot of things that it's really not about. <clears throat> um, and then we're going to move into, uh, and this first part might be a little bit academic, um, but we're going to move into the more spiritual aspect after that, and, and then uh, we'll kind of do the same for the last two. We'll give a little bit of academics, and when I say academics, I mean a lot more emphasis on the scriptures and looking at the scriptures and finding what the scriptures say as opposed to <clears throat> spiritual application. So, um, and then should we have enough time, which I'm sure that we won't, but should we have enough time, this dovetails perfectly, totally by accident with where I left off in Philippians. <laughs> Chapter 2, that's right, and verse 8 through 11. So, <clears throat> However, I do not think we're going to get there. I really don't. There's no way. But it's nice to dream. But it really, it really will be built on that wonderful foundation there in Philippians 2. And all that we say will have a lot of, of that in it. <clears throat> all right, so... Um, the, the name of this class is the Gospels, and we know the Gospel as the basic belief system that Christians believe whereby they get saved. So someone might ask someone else, have you heard the Gospel? Okay, so that's, that's a term that I want to identify right from the very beginning. And, um, but along with that is the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're known as the Gospels, okay? So, 
that's an important distinction. Um, and when we, when we look at one of them, we, we look at, for example, Luke's um, description of the life of Christ. We call that Luke's Gospel. <clears throat> and um, so these, these four books and the saving gospel of Christ are, are tied together or equated together, which, let me just say it like that, they're equated together, the gospel and the gospels. <clears throat> and um, uh, so I just want to make sure that we, we get this distinction, that the gospel is the basic belief system that Christians have, whereas the gospels is in reference to the first four books of the New Testament. And here's why, because I'm going to be going back and forth on those as we get a little further into this, <clears throat> and it's important that you know which one we're talking about when we're talking about it. <clears throat> All right, uh, to get through this course, I'm gonna do some reading. I really am gonna try to get through this course with all my heart. But I don't think I'm gonna make it. <laughs> but I'm gonna try. All right, so I'm gonna I am gonna do that. Uh, the first question that I have here is: Do the Gospels present the Gospel? Do the Gospels present the Gospel? All right. Though the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are entitled with the term gospel, yet there are questions that arise concerning this connection. I want to give particular emphasis to the first three gospels. Is the gospel in the gospels? Again, giving particular reference to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <clears throat> Is the goal of the gospels to present the gospel? Could there be a purpose for the Gospels beyond evangelization by the Gospel? All right. So that should challenge you right from the very beginning because most of us have been taught that the Gospel, that's why they're called the Gospels because they're presenting the Gospel. And I'm, I'm bringing up questions with the hope, <clears throat> number one, to make you think outside of what you've been taught and then to consider, as I said, we'll get into very deeply into a lot of scriptures as we go um, in different sections. But first, we need <clears throat> to confront ideas that we may have pertaining to the Gospels that's not even in line with God's primary purpose for them. Well, that's not a bad thing if, if we're if we're wrong in our assumptions of what it's about, we want to know what the Lord has in mind. We want to know what the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate to us specifically, uh, <clears throat> instead, if, if indeed instead of the gospel and then evangelization by the gospel. It is my belief that the primary purpose of the gospel writers was not that of seeking to communicate the atonement or what we tend to call the gospel. <laughs> However, I believe that there is a purpose for which the Gospels were written that is beyond what the average believer holds for them. All right. As the way that I view any of this is, if there's any question as to my view or my understanding of the Word of God that is not in line with His Word, <clears throat> I do not swallow anything uh, hook, line, and sinker. In fact, on Sunday, I, this last Sunday, I preached and uh, was talking about <clears throat> uh, Mary pondering these things in her heart, the things that she heard. If you will, strange things, different things. She's a virgin. You're going to have a baby. You're not just going to have a baby. He's the son of God. You know, and she's going, look. I'm from Nazareth, you know what I mean? I mean, can any good thing come out of Oak Cliff? <clears throat> anyway, uh, inside joke there. <clears throat> uh, and so my heart is to know the Lord and not know the standard uh, given ideas behind that. And I will tell you, right, wrong, or indifferent, in anything that I share, 
I dig into the scriptures. I want to know. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to, you know, go off on some teaching that's not going to glorify Christ and that's going to somehow be twisted and perverted to, to glorify man in some way. All right, so um, before we address these comments, let's, let us define <clears throat> the generally understood meaning of the term gospels. To put it succinctly, the gospel is bound up in the fact that Jesus died for our sins to save us from punishment in hell. As a result, now we are forgiven and brought close to God by Jesus' blood. We are justified by faith. This all comes to us by grace and not works. Does any of that sound off? <laughs> That's what's understood, basically, as the gospel. Okay? <clears throat> um, this is basically what most hold as the meaning of believing in Christ and following him. <clears throat> the gospel is understood as to what Jesus accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? I want you to think about that statement. That's just, I, I think we, that just so readily goes to our ear and settles easily to it. So let me reread that again. <clears throat> um, let's see, where did I get it from? The gospel, is, um, the gospel is understood as to what Jesus accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. I don't think any of us have a hard time with that on a certain level. We shouldn't because it's there. But I, here's what I want you to remember. That statement, the gospel is understood as to what Jesus accomplished, and this is the part right here, in his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Just, just hold that thought. Just keep it. Because way down the road, we're going we're gonna to have to look at some things in relationship to the Gospels. All right, so this is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. You can listen to me read it however you want to do it. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And, and what this is is a pretty basic explanation of the Gospel that Paul wrote down. Okay, ready? 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. All right, anybody have a problem with that? Those verses. Okay. Well, it's the Bible, for God's sake. If you do, we need to talk after class. Yeah. <clears throat> However, yeah, I'm glad it's there. <clears throat> However, there is a problem. In fact, there's a couple of problems, not with the scripture, but with our understanding of that and with if that scripture is true then that's going to shine a completely different light on the gospels and we need to we need to look at that <clears throat> all right uh, you might have considered this fact but most of our modern day explanations for the gospel cons consist most of most of our modern day explanations for what the gospel consists does not come from the Gospels. In other words, most of the doctrine we have for the does not come. And I'll, I'll give you an explanation of what I mean by that uh, as we get down here a little way. <clears throat> um, well, I'll just say this. We're not talking about the event because that clearly mentions the event. We're talking about the implications of death, burial, and resurrection. And in those implications is the gospel. Can I get an amen? That's where, that's where we really start grasping reality as God sees it. <clears throat> All right, so 
Um, instead, the majority of believers look to the Gospels to give them a historical setting for the Gospel as set forth in the epistles. But the Gospels, here it comes, the Gospels do not explain the basic teachings that make up the Gospel. Okay. Now, that's, you know, when we hear that, we go, yeah, that's right. But isn't it funny that in a, a certain pocket of our mind that we have always sort of said the Gospels are presenting the Gospel? I mean, I, I, you, you couldn't be condemned for thinking that because everybody sort of assumes that. <clears throat> but we're looking at this in a little bit different light now. All right. Comparing Jesus, well, let me just uh, let me just read this. To help see if this is actually the case, let's compare the teachings of Matthew, Mark, and Luke as set forth in the Gospels with the basic teachings understood to be the Gospel as described in the epistles. To do this, let us first ask some probing questions, and then let's look at this chart. All right, first a few questions. In the Gospels, did Jesus set forth the fullness of the Gospel as we know it? Wow. It's, I mean, does that affect anybody to think, wait a minute, my Lord, you know? I mean, I thought Jesus came to preach the Gospel, and so that's where we look at the chart now. <clears throat> All right, so I've divided the chart between the Gospels and the teaching that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even John have given us, and the gospel teaching as we get from the epistles. Okay, you up for that? All right. Deb, could you just look at the chart for a minute? <laughs> oh, she could. <laughs> You're out of here. All right, here we go. Number one, the gospels teach the incarnation, right? God with us. That God with us, by the way, folks, is not Christ in you. It is the incarnation. God with us, Emmanuel. But the gospel teaches Christ in us. Not just God with us. And yes, in the gospels, it was God with us, wasn't it? He was, and he walked among us, but he was not in us. <clears throat> All right. And... and, <clears throat> and other than John, the other three really don't even sort of lean very much in the direction of Christ being in you. Okay, next one, touched by Jesus. Jesus walked around and he healed the sick and he touched them and he cast out demons and he did all this stuff. And so, and, and you know, if we really comprehend this, it might shatter some people, not necessarily people here, but it could shatter some people's understanding because they may still be leaning to the Gospels and have not come on, on in to the Gospel fully. You understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> Touched by Jesus, but we're his body. And as such, we're his hands, amen, and we're his feet, and he touches through us. And, you know, instead of we're the one that wants to get touched all the time, we want him, his life, to touch others through us. And not just healing, but through all the ways in which Jesus can do that. The, the next one up there, <clears throat> Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Remember, that was said. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away sin. But in the gospel, Jesus has fulfilled all sacrifices, not just the sin offering. Right? And the fullness of the gospel is not just that he died for our sins, but that he died for our sins, and he also fulfilled every other offering that was there. Yeah, Scott? Are you on a microphone up there? Okay, be loud. Well, I'm glad people can hear you because they call me a heretic for saying. <laughs> <clears throat> and yet, the go okay, let me just, I'm already under fire, you know, for a million other things, so might as well just lay it on out there. S Scott basically is saying that I said in a previous class that the Gospels are not really 
in the New Testament, uh, that it begins after that, Book of Acts and on. And the reason, the reason why I say that is because the gospel is the gospel of salvation that didn't begin until the cross and didn't affect anybody outside of that until they received his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, so that was after his death because they didn't know going in, did they, what his death was about. They just thought it was a killing an innocent man. But it was after that, and those that believed on it, that's when the gospel began. Okay. Again, well, you don't have to believe what I say. It's just that all these kind of things challenge me. I get challenged, and I go, I have to start looking at things and being real. And, uh, you know, not, you know, the Bible talks more about being self-deceived than the devil deceiving you. Did you know that? It has many more references to you deceiving yourself than it does to the devil deceiving you. And I don't want to, to formulate a way of thinking that resists something that I have not heard or seen or whatever, because clearly the only way that I can resist any, you know, if it's a general tenor of me to resist anything, any teaching that I've never heard before, then that, that would necessitate, for it to be right, would necessitate that, I have, that I'm omniscient, that I have all knowledge. But if I don't have all knowledge, guess what? I'm thinking there's quite a few areas that I don't yet know. So I don't want to, I'm saying all that to say, I don't want to formulate a way of thinking that says, well, I know more than you, or, you know, and that, you know, that can come by, that can come by uh, living in a little fishbowl, you know, New Creation Fellowship or Acts Bible School or a million other groups and you don't ever get outside of that. But I tell you what, I read, and I read other people's stuff, and I don't just read the deeper life people that flow our way. I read things, um, and I ponder those in my heart, like we were talking about with Mary. I don't, I don't take anything hook, line, and sinker, even if it sounds just right. I want the Holy Spirit to explain that to me. So I ponder it and I, and I lay it out as it were on a table and I let him mess with it and fool with it until he shoves it over in front of me and goes, there it is. And I go, Phew, boy, you can't deny that, you know. <clears throat> all right, so, and with that goes attitudes of knowing it all and, you know, all that stuff. We don't know it all. I don't know it all. I mean, you know, I, I've, I say it regularly. I am a, a just a, pastor in a small town with a few sheep. I've said that to great conferences where, you know, there were thousands, and I said, look, I'm nobody, okay? I am nobody. I don't, I don't even have but a few sheep in my congregation. So why should you listen to me? Only if the Lord dictates, and only if the Lord leads you to do that, because it's not my credentials that are going to open people up to what I share. It's got to be the Holy Spirit. So I just stay out of that arena of thinking myself more highly than I ought. You know, it's just, it's just better not to go in those directions. <clears throat> All right. So uh, when it comes to spiritual warfare, basically when Jesus walked the earth, he was teaching them hand-to-hand -hand combat. Go out and cast the demons out of people. Go cast in my name. You shall cast out the devil. Clearly in the Gospels. But in the New Testament, it talks about us that he defeated the enemy, that he made a show of him openly, and that we have been, Colossians, we have been delivered from, delivered, E-D, past tense, delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's past tense. So on, not, and listen carefully, when because this is, this is, this differs with, the explanation of spiritual warfare. People talk about spiritual warfare. They, they will teach a congregation or whatever. They will say, look, you have power over the devil. God has given you authority. All you have to do is say, devil, kill it out. And all this stuff. Okay. Guess what? Jesus gave them power and authority when he walked the earth. But when he rose from the dead, 
now we are able to engage the enemy based on the fact that he's already defeated. Not just some, like, okay, power and authority. Um, power is my gun, okay? Authority, that's my badge, all right? So I walk around going, I got power and authority. But if you had a paper that said, look, the war is over, you don't need power. You don't even need authority. Your authority is what Christ has done at the cross. Does that make sense? <clears throat> All right. So, as usual, you know, believe it or not, I get tired of teaching things that may not flow the way that most people are taught. But if, it's, if I think that that's the truth, man, I've got to hold on to what I believe. And you have to hold on to what you believe if it goes contrary to what I teach. Do you know that? Because you're going to stand before God for what you believe, not for what I believe. But that also puts the responsibility on you that if what I'm saying is right, you need to get into the Word and check it out. Amen? Amen. All right. <clears throat> and you do that because you're hungry for the Lord, because you, you want to know the truth. All right. So, in the Gospels, spiritual warfare was primarily related, and that doesn't mean that we don't still cast out demons, but we do it on a different basis. Not power and authority, but by a finished work. The, the, uh, the war has been won. All right, we see in the Gospels that Jesus died, clearly. Clearly Jesus died. But what we don't see in the Gospels is that we died, you know, you don't see anybody walking up to the cross, seeing Jesus hanging there and going, you know, like, you know, there's the thief on either side, and they look at Jesus hanging there and go, oh, my God, I'm up there. I'm dead. You don't see anybody doing that. You don't see anybody actually even perceiving that that's a sacrifice. It's just a, the miscarriage of justice. <clears throat> that's the way most people at that moment, at that time, might have seen if they leaned toward Jesus. The other side would say, well, this is justice. He was an evil man because of, you know, all those evil things he did and stuff. <laughs> I don't know why they couldn't have figured that out, but nonetheless. <clears throat> all right. He arose, but in him we arose. Make sure you can see that. He arose, but in him we arose. The lower this gets, the harder it's going to be on Skype people to read, so I'm just going to read it for you. Um, there is none of that as far as Jesus outright saying in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, you know, that, you know, look, I'm going to die, and you're going to die with me. Don't, don't worry, though. You'll be in me, and we're all coming up, baby. Are you with me, Mike? <laughs> but we really don't get that. We don't get that until, really in a big way, until Paul comes along. You know? <clears throat> All right. And then um, our sins are forgiven. Well, there's some talk of that in the Gospels, isn't there? Amen. But not that the old man is dead. That's the Gospel. The source. I wrote old man is dead. The source of sins has been put to death, okay? <clears throat> so, you, you, you really almost, the picture that you're getting in the Gospels is very similar to the Jewish picture, that if we kill this lamb, my sins will be forgiven, but the deal ain't over with because I'm going to have to be back, you know? And a lot of Christians even live that way. Because they, they're, they're gaining their understanding of the gospel by the gospels. Does that make sense? I mean, very challenging on one front. But all of that is true. And by, by seeing the gospels wrap up with Jesus, he died. And uh, nobody's, nobody's nudging somebody standing there in front of the cross going, now, he's a sacrifice for sins. This is the fulfillment 
of the sacrifice where this is like an altar here. You see this cross? This is like, <laughs> you know, you don't see that. And if you had him, he'd probably be dead because you go, oh, you're stupid, you know. And we're right there in him, you know. None of that. None of that. <clears throat> and then finally, resurrection, but we don't fully understand the ascension. In fact, many Christians. They know the term, but they do not understand the ascension. They understand that Jesus was dead and now he got up. So guess what? They don't even understand the resurrection. Because their version of resurrection is that, that um, uh, Lazarus, who died, and Jesus, who died, they're no different. They both died and they both got up. Yay! Yeah. So... You know, as I've often said when we get to this point, you know, I've heard people say, you know, Jesus died, but he rose again. You can't keep a good man down. And I'm thinking, really? That's it, huh? You know, I'll remember that. That'll, that ought to do me a lot of good, you know. <laughs> First of all, there's none good but him. So there's no hope for me in that saying. All right. <clears throat> so... Um, My uh, next topic, subtopic is vague references to the atonement. Now, wouldn't you think, wouldn't you think, I mean, okay, put yourself in that position that Jesus died and he rose again and you know what that really means. And so you're going to write a letter that's going to go to all the churches and explain it. What would that sound like? Every opportunity, you already do this when you go home for Christmas. Every opportunity you get to share Jesus in there, you start telling me what, the, you know. You don't really see that spirit going on. You don't see that happening. And I'll give you some examples of that uh, shortly. <clears throat> Many refer to the four gospel writers as four evangelists. Did you know that? That's a common thing. They refer to them as four evangelists, which means they are what? Trying to evangelize us. By what means? By the gospel. And yet they're telling the story that happened in the gospels, but they're not throwing in the gospel, that happened in the gospels, but they're not throwing in the gospels hardly at all. Again, we'll, we'll give you some good examples of that. <clears throat> Many refer to the four gospel writers as four evangelists, but they, in fact, are not setting forth the saving gospel message as most know it. We're talking about the basic gospel message that most people know. Ask yourself this question, and when I, when I give you this question, I don't mean just ask it now. I mean keep asking as we go into this because it, it'll... It might possibly change your answer as we go. Does it seem as if the atonement is, is the primary point? Let me do that again. Does it seem as if the atonement is the primary point they're trying to communicate to their readers? The primary point, the atonement. <clears throat> when examined more closely, one might discover that the gospel writers did not seem to make the task of evangelizing their readers their main goal. Notice I said main goal. As we shall see with further study, Jesus seemed to barely and even vaguely mention salvation or saving the whole world compared to the approach of many believers as they seek to evangelize. In other words, you, you take a team of people out on the street, let's just say out on the street or door to door, and they knock on that door, what are they going to say as, as compared to what these evangelists seem to be saying? Yeah, yeah, and they would really go off on all that, and yet we have chapter after chapter where there's no mention of that, and there are opportunities all along the way. <clears throat> um, it did not seem to be Jesus' primary emphasis. He only gives vague references to all the important doctrines, such as 
being dead and raised in Christ, the revelation of Christ, the need for the revelation of Christ, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the need for the revelation of Christ, being crucified with Christ, the reality of the new creation. It's like, <laughs> where is it? That's right. Well said, Mallory. It's like, well, where is it? Now, this is particularly impacting to someone that can think this through and remember all the things that we say and that we call the gospel. We put it in a nice little package and we say, okay, let's present the gospel. Okay. And I'm saying, and I'm going to remind you that I'm saying, I'm not just saying that they're, I'm not saying they're sharing another gospel. I'm saying that the gospel of the atonement is not the true purpose for the gospels, evangelizing its readers. That's what I'm saying. All right, when the gospel writers address the subject of the cross, they're not delineating Christ's death as the salvation of the whole world, as stated above. And I'm, and I'm even thinking of, you know, <clears throat> um, let's just think in Luke 24 where he's walking along the road with the, on the road to Emmaus, okay? These, these guys that are walking along here, they're believers, they have, they're disciples, they have walked with the Lord, okay, for years apparently. <clears throat> but Jesus dies, and then they hear some rumor that maybe he rose from the dead. But they're going, they're leaving Jerusalem, they're leaving the hub of the, what's supposedly going on. And what are they talking about? Oh, we, would, we had hoped that, what? That he was the one, the Messiah. Not, not, the, the Messiah for them was a Jewish concept, not to us. The word Christ is the same word, and the word Christ is very full. It's like a honeycomb. It is not just a big shot title that he got because he was a Jew or something. It's not. There's huge meaning behind all that. <clears throat> so they're saying we'd hope that he's one. Well, what happens then? All right, Jesus will straighten them out. He shows up. Right? But it doesn't give the feeling that he is preaching to them the gospel of atonement, that it, but rather he is showing himself throughout the Old Testament. And when they get done, they don't say... Didn't our hearts burn when we received Christ as Savior and realized that he was a sacrifice for sin and this is the fulfillment of all the, you know, the tabernacle and the offerings and the temple and my God. And they just said, didn't our hearts burn within us when we heard him talking? You don't, you don't sense that this was an evangelistic episode. <laughs> Which really blows the minds of people that their whole existence is about evangelizing and they think that everything is about evangelizing. But when you start looking at these different scenarios, you start realizing these guys had an opportunity, of what we would call the opportunity, and they didn't take it. What is wrong? What is going wrong here? Well, nothing's going wrong. The gospel's purpose is not to evangelize with the atone, atoning work of Christ. That's not its purpose. It has a purpose, but that's not its purpose. <clears throat> All right, so we see almost nothing communicated concerning the need for faith in an atoning sacrifice. Now, does that get any plainer? We see almost nothing concerning the need for an atoning, what was the word there, for, for faith in an atoning sacrifice going on. Now, you do in the book of Acts, don't you? Think about it. Peter gets up there and he preaches a good message there. 
and it gets people saved. I mean, people start coming in. But nobody seems to be getting that idea in the Gospels. And here's the kicker. These guys, this, they wrote this way down the road, so they knew the gospel. So they, if you will, they knew the purpose of all Christianity is to get people saved, if that is indeed. And they're not doing it. I mean, even if the stories aren't, they are writing this. We can jump in right here and say, you know what this is about, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> All right, so uh, there is, uh, I'll read that last one. We see almost nothing communicated concerning the need for faith in, in a, an atoning sacrifice. There's almost nothing of our debt of sin being removed by the crucified Christ. All right. How much time have we got here? Yeah, you know, really, 20 minutes. Okay, instead of doing that. Okay, my subtitle is How the Gospels Present Jesus' Death and Resurrection. How the Gospels, not the Gospel, but how the Gospels present Jesus' death and resurrection. Are you ready? The Gospels give us the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, but give little as to their spiritual meaning of those events. This can be seen by the fact that even the disciples did not seem to know that he was dying for their sins. Now they had, you don't, don't forget this, they had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. You'd think if Jesus' purpose and words was primarily getting people saved, they would have got it. And he would have made sure they got it. Can I get an amen? I mean, wouldn't he? You would have. If that's what you thought the deal was about, you would have said, look, I am going away in three and a half years. So I want you to listen carefully, because if you don't, you're going to hell. <laughs> you know? So I'm going to tell you, but I'm not only going to tell you, I'm going to do some stuff on this cross over here. When I do this stuff on the cross, be ready, because that's where the action's going to be, okay? Jesus doesn't do any of that. He does say, yes, I'm going to die, I'm going to be mistreated, but he doesn't say why, and he doesn't say, he doesn't say that he's the fulfillment of all the Jewish sacrifices he just goes you know I'm going to go to Jerusalem they're going to kill me he didn't say I got an idea why don't you have faith in it doesn't do that <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying I'm trying to really just show you that this is maybe it's not that big a deal y'all it, it's earth shattering to me to realize how clearly the gospel is not in the gospels and yet even by that clarity, then I must cry out and say, then what is it about? What is this thing about? And, and, and Lord, show me. And like I said, I mean, uh, one section, man, we're going to just go through a ton of scriptures um, to just solidify what it really is about. Because what seems to be vague or not mentioned concerning the atoning sacrifice throughout the Gospels, particularly through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this other area is just filled. It's everywhere. Wow. It's mentioned throughout the gospel. And interesting, I'll just throw out something here. Stories, stories that we hold within themselves, you know, well, you know, I'm, there's so many parables and then stories of Jesus and his disciples and the healings and stuff like that. Stories of that that we see as just little incidences along the way, it, in so many of those, it's mentioning, it is saying, this is what this is about. And it's not talking about the atoning sacrifice of Christ. But it is telling you, it's signaling, it's going, hey, hey, that's what this is about. And we just go, that's a nice story. You know, oh, good parable, Jesus. 
I wish I had a thought of that one. I'd have used it. <laughs> uh, th this is because the Gospels were not seeking to present the Gospel per se, but only its shell. Obviously, the historical event of the crucifixion is important to the Gospel, but the primary basis of the gospel message is not bound up with belief that the physical events took place, but more with the spiritual implication behind the events, such as justification, adoption, being crucified with Christ. The spiritual implications are really what the gospel is about. Yes, it's important to see that Christ died on that cross and, and, then, to, and then to go into the epistles and whatever and and get the meaning and then apply the meaning to those events but it's still at that point just a shell by which we come to know the spiritual implications that change our lives as again if you if you stood there looking at the cross you wouldn't see justification by faith there you wouldn't see it somebody would have to tell you that later and they did and they did but my point of saying that is that just the act and the event itself without any true spiritual knowledge means nothing it, it can't have an it's you know it's like Deb being on that phone and me saying, look at the chart on the board, you know. She can't do it. She can only hear what we're talking about. <clears throat> Man, that was a long sentence. One, two, three, four and a half lines for that one sentence. Did you get, did you get the whole thing I said there? I'm sure. Mike, could you say it back for me? <laughs> Amen, brother. Well, that's I'm known for bringing, giving rest to the people of God. <clears throat> In the Gospels, the good news does not actually seem to appear as good news until a few chapters at the very end. <laughs> you know, nobody's even really clued very much that this. Oh, this is all good news. This is what was supposed to happen. The general feeling is, this is out of control. Yeah. You know, what happened, man? We had something really good going here. All right, let me, let me just read a few more sentences, and we'll take a break here. <clears throat> um, actually, just one. The rest, the, rest of the, the rest of the Gospels, like I said, let me just read this again, the, the one I just read. The Gospels give us none of that. In the Gospels, the good news does not actually seem to appear as good news until a few chapters at the very end. Okay, so let's, let's look at it linearly. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, all the way down to however long each of the Gospels go. And you get down here, and all of a sudden there's some implications. Luke 24, oh, no, no, this is good stuff. You know what I mean? But we're still not, it's still not written out why it's good stuff, but we can just tell that people are happier than they were when they were looking at the cross. <laughs> okay? So my question is pertaining to the rest that is not mentioned, not done anything from chapter 1 up to that moment. The rest consists of details pertaining to the extraordinary life of one particular man, Jesus. Okay? And I'll just say it like this, and none of it particularly having to do with the atonement. All right. All right, let's take a break, and we shall return. <laughs> 